Hello once again and welcome back to the Tank Encyclopedia's Mouse series. My name is Cone of Arc and today we're going to be talking about the production, armament, as well as a couple other details of the mouse. Even before a finished design was ready or approved, Hitler, in November 1942, ordered that five Moissian were to be built and a timetable set by Waffenprüfungsamt IV to achieve this. Turret and hull drawings were to be ready and approved by March 1943 and then five vehicles built within just six to seven months, an ambitious and unrealistic schedule, as this also called for trials by 5th May 1943. The Heerswaffenamt arranged for Colonel Honnell to help ensure timetables for the mouse were adhered to by going from firm to firm to press them to meet production requirements and, if necessary, assess severe penalties for missing deadlines. Krupp received a contract in December 1942 for a complete prototype mouse turret, followed a month later by a contract for a hull. An agreement between Krupp and Porsche in the middle of January 1943 stated that assembly was to take place at the Alquette Works by September 1943. Several firms were actually involved in the production of the mouse. The initial drawings for the turret and hull, which were due in March, were actually ready on 21st January 1943, and the production of 120 vehicles was ordered on 10th February. Production of the first mouse hulls had started very quickly after the design was authorized and, for this reason, it was too late to make the change to the improved side armor scheme for the first vehicles. By the end of May 1943, though, a problem had been identified. The tolerances on the armor plates of 3% meant that those 180mm thick side panels could actually be up to 185.4mm thick each, meaning an additional 11mm or so in potential width. As the original design was exactly 3,700 millimeters wide, the maximum limit for the German rail gauge, any additional width created a huge problem as the tank would be out of gauge. As a result of the first four holes already having been welded together that month, they were allowed to be finished as long as the width was kept to 3,715 millimeters, as even this out of gauge width was just about manageable. This width problem had to be addressed, and in order to guarantee that the maximum width would not be exceeded, after hole number 5, the outer 180mm armor was to be milled down even more than before, an extra 10mm was to be shaved off the outside, effectively doubling the amount of machining that was needed on those plates, as well as reducing the armor to 170mm thick upper and 90mm lower. This was to be a temporary solution to the problem, rectified from hole number 14 onwards, where the plates were to be rolled 170 millimeters thick to begin with. The fact that in May they could only implement this change for hole 14 onwards strongly suggests that at least 13 holes were already in preparation by 26th May 1943 when the order was delivered, with the first four finished holes undergoing assembly. Thus, before even the first vehicle was finished, there would effectively be three slightly different made mouse, the consequences of not producing prototypes. Exactly a month after this debacle was uncovered, in an effort to reduce the time required for welding, Porsche requested Krupp to mill the side plates of holes 3 and 4 to match those scheduled for 5 to 13. Further changes to the holes were far less drastic than milling off 10 millimeters from each side, through the summer of 1943, amendments to the hull were dominated by the boring of towing holes. The only firm in all of Germany with a machine capable of milling these enormous plates was at Krupp's factory, and any damage to that machine would therefore cripple fabrication. Ensuring a system whereby the side armor needed no milling meant that production was not reliant upon a single machine. This was achieved by a reduction of side armor to allow for manufacturing tolerances to still stay within the rail gauge and the change to a type of suspension not dependent upon the side skirts to support it. The production schedule was a tight one as well, with an order in May 1943 for the initial 120 tanks increased to 135, with the first two vehicles expected to be ready for November that year. Production of hulls, therefore, was supposed to be five the following month, 
then 8 in January 1944, with production becoming streamlined and up to full speed with 10 per month from February 1944 onwards. The 120 production target, therefore, would deliver the last mouse hull in January 1945 and the 135th mouse by April 1945. Turret production was expected to keep pace with the hulls, albeit to trail them by one month, with the 135th turret to be delivered in May 1945. The Waffenamt, however, had issued contracts for production of 141 mouse by June 1943, and production of the main sections of armor had already begun when Hena al Oberst Guderian overruled this order and reduced the order to just five in order for them to be tested under real combat situations before a full order was placed. The Panzer Commission changed this reduced order from a total of five to just five per month instead on 1st July. Eleven days later, the six experimental chassis already in hand were given official production serial numbers 351451 to 351456, with serial numbers assigned to production vehicles from 351457 to 351591. When less than a month later, Krupp's plant in Essen was bombed by the Allies. The concerns about the single milling machine were proven to be justified. Production ground to a halt with a delay of a month to clear the rubble away, leaving 30 mouse in various stages of production. A previous bombing raid in March 1943 had not affected hull production, but had caused an estimated two-month delay on turrets as the wooden mock-up had been burned. Thus, the first trial turret was not going to be available until the middle of November, a month behind schedule, and now two months behind the scheduled delivery of the first hull. With production delays caused by bombing, Krupp, seemingly without any warning, received orders on 27th October 1943 that instead of 120 vehicles, just one mouse was to be completed instead. All of the unused armor plates were ordered to be transferred to the Sturmgeschütz program at Harkat Eichen instead, excluding those already prepared for use in mouse construction. More bad news for Krupp followed, with an order to cancel further development of the tank and cancellation of orders for series production of the turrets and hulls. On 5th November, another order clarified the situation, changing the initial batch of six prototype turrets to just one, a week later, the contract for six prototype hulls was changed to just two. With work cancelled, there seemed little point in finishing hull number one, which still needed some machining work done, but was otherwise finished. It was sent from Krupp to Alket on 26th September 1943, where it was fitted with the internal components and drivetrain. This was completed on 22nd December and then ordered to be shipped to the testing grounds at Bublingen on 10th January 1944. When it left for Bublingen the next day via railway, the vehicle was able to move under its own power and load itself, but work on the hull was otherwise incomplete inside. The journey to Bublingen took three days. The second mouse hull arrived at Alcat on 8th January, but work stopped by the middle of the month with a focus on Sturmgeschütz assembly instead. After about a fortnight of lying idle, it was decided to ship the partially assembled hull to Bublingen to finish the work. The single turret which had been ordered to be completed did not fare much better. It was not finished until the middle of April 1944, several months behind schedule, no doubt as a result of being a low-priority project as serial production had been cancelled. It was then inspected by Waffenprüfungsamt 6, which made several changes to the design to rectify some minor deficiencies, but neither Krupp nor Alcat were going to implement them at their primary factories. The mouse project was all but over, and this single turret was to be sent directly to Bublingen instead, where technicians from Krupp could finish work on it. Arriving at Bublingen on 3rd May 1944, turret number 1 was finally mounted on hull number 2 during the night of 7th to 8th June 1944. The most critical element in a tank edging up towards 200 tons was how it was to be carried. Somewhat impressively, the designers of the various Moissia never seemed to have considered the easy solution of adopting plain rollers, as was adopted on the much lighter TOG-2 in the UK. Instead, the design had originally planned to simply copy the suspension from the Tiger, but as the weight of the design ballooned from 100 tons to around 150 tons, even a strengthened form of Tiger suspension had to be abandoned. Instead, the designers from Porsche focused their attention on multiple small wheels to spread the load, and these were arranged in groups of bogies running on a very wide track to spread the weight. This was fine in theory 
except that no one had attempted to make an effective suspension system for a tank of this weight before. The original ideas for the suspension back in October 1942 had 12 double road wheels per side using units copied directly from the Tiger P, but by January 1943, this was down to just 10 sets. These pairs of road wheels were suspended between the inner hull and the outer skirt of armor on a large support pin. This was the primary reason the side armor had to be made in one piece until the suspension was redesigned. When, in March 1943, a new system of Laufwerk was adopted, it took the loading off the side armor, allowing for the manufacturing process to the improved system. That system came too late for the first six hulls, but as hull 7 had not yet been assembled, the changes could be adopted from number 7 onwards. Further suspension improvements followed in April 1943, with the previously welded suspension supports being replaced with ones that bolted onto the hull instead. However, this meant boring holes through the armor plate in order to accommodate longitudinal supporting arms for the torsion bar suspension. The design for the track, which was shown on 21st January 1943, differed from the earlier work on suspension for the tank to take into account the growing weight of the machine. Developed by Dr. Porsche, the system was unique with no compatibility with the suspension from any other tank. This new suspension system had removed the need for the side skirts to bear some of the suspension load, and also allowed for an additional set of bogies to be added to the design. Running on a new design of track 1100mm wide, this arrangement allowed for a better distribution of weight to the track which in turn allowed for improved crossing of soft ground. Not only did this new compact design allow for an extra bogey, it also reduced weight by a significant 4 tons. These new suspension units were not to be built by Porsche or Krupp, but by Skoda as a subcontractor. The wheels, fitted with a steel tire, contained a heavy rubber ring within them as a shock absorber and were identified, even before testing, as a weak point. They were a hangover from the urgent need to change from torsion bars to volute spring suspension in February 1943 in order to create space for the flame projector system. Dr. Porsche always preferred torsion bars, and this was the original and favored system for the mouse, but with the flame projector requirement forced upon him at very short notice, he complained that he lacked the time to test a new type of heavier torsion bar system, and reluctantly agreed to what he considered to be an inferior system of volute springs. Tested in January 1944, the internal rubber rings in these wheels failed after only a short distance, and were replaced with an improved type of wheel in March 1944. The first hulls, which were in the process of being made, were to have holes for the bracing arms bored into the hull sides and side skirts, a lengthy process. This redesign meant that holes would still have to be bored out of the inside of the side skirts and in the hull, but they would only be bearing the load of the bolts for the horseshoe-shaped sections for holding the strebin, meaning that the lower side skirts could be made thinner and could be welded onto the upper section. The ends of the bolts holding these horseshoe-shaped mounts for the strebin are visible along the bottom edge of the side skirt. Right from the start, the goal was to create a 100-ton tank with a heavy gun, and on 14th April 1942, the gun in question was identified as the 15cm L40. This gun used unitary cartridges instead of a shell with separate bag charges. The desire was to be able to fire 4-5 to five rounds per minute, but during the development of this weapon, it was decided to reduce the desired shell weight from 43 kilograms to 34 kilograms, and to compensate for this with an increase in muzzle velocity to 845 meters per second. Just as with the early concept for this vehicle, which became the Yag Tiger, there was an initial expectation for the tank to be able to operate in indirect fire mode, which is to act as field artillery. This is evidenced by the fact that although the elevation limits for the gun were minus 8 to plus 15 degrees, it was desired that the gun should be able to be elevated to plus 40 around its entire arc of rotation. There could be no reason for this except to act in an indirect fire capacity, and this turret was to be offered to Porsche for use in its VK101 by the middle of May, leaving just 3-4 to four weeks to design it. Krupp's engineers planned another turret designed based around a different gun, the 12.8cm L50, which could fire a slightly lighter 29.3kg shell at 810 meters per second. By the middle of May, it was expected that even these guns were not going to be able to deliver the anti-armor punch which was desired of this new tank, and caliber lengths of L60 and L72 should be considered even though, as of that time, those guns did not exist. A month later, the guns had changed again, 
with Porsche suggesting a 15cm L37 or 10.5cm L70 gun, with Hitler selecting the 10.5cm gun for reasons of improved ammunition stowage and a better rate of fire. At this time, Hitler was against the adoption of a second turret with a 7.5cm gun. In July 1942, Krupp was issued a contract by Waffenprüfungsamt 6 for the June design under the name Panzerkampfwagen Mäuschen to mount a pair of guns in a single mounting in a single turret. The guns in question, despite Hitler's selection of a 10.5cm gun, were the 15cm KWK L31 and the 7.5cm KWK L24. The combination of these guns would allow the Moissian to deliver effective indirect high-explosive shell fire, but also direct fire against armored targets. Both guns were able to achieve an elevation of minus 7 to plus 25 degrees, although a British examination in 1945 states elevation was limited to plus 23 degrees. At the start of December 1942, Hitler ordered a trials vehicle to be ready for summer 1943, but wanted information on the performance of the 15cm gun, the 12.7cm naval gun, 12.8cm flak gun, and a new 12.8cm gun with a longer length. When on 3rd January 1943, Hitler met with armaments minister Albert Speer, he ordered the Moissian into production by the end of the year, but was still debating what the final gun was to be. The candidate guns were essentially the same as before, albeit the 12.7cm naval gun idea was dropped. Hitler was still favoring the 12.8cm gun option, although a 15cm gun option was to be projected too and the secondary 7.5cm gun was still being retained. By January 1943, the gun for the mouse had been selected. It was to be a 12.8cm gun, 55 calibers long and capable of firing new ammunition to achieve the performance required against enemy armor. An option was retained to switch out the 12.8cm gun with a 15cm L38 gun to provide additional high explosive power and both options could be fitted on the same carriage, making exchange simple. Whichever gun was used, it was to be paired with a 7.5cm L36 gun. Originally, the secondary armament was intended to be a 7.5cm KWK L24, but this was changed out prior to January 1943 with a slightly longer version. The ammunition remained unchanged, but the addition of the slightly longer gun meant a small increase in anti-armor performance. An additional weapon planned in January 1943 was a 2cm flat gun built into the turret. In December 1942, before the design of the mouse was even approved, a supplemental system to protect the tank from enemy infantry and to attack enemy positions was proposed, and Porsche was ordered to add this to his design on 2nd February 1944 by Colonel Hanel. At a meeting held in Stuttgart on 10th February, representatives of all the manufacturers complained about this late addition to the design and that the added complications would slow down production. This Flammenwerfer Anlage was based on the Gross Flammenwerfer system which had been installed in a Panzer III but a long range of 150 to 200 meters was wanted for the flame projector on the mouse. The Gross Flammenwerfer as used on the Panzer III was made by Hermann Kobe of Feuerwehrgerät Fabrik of Berlin, a manufacturer of firefighting equipment, and they were asked if they could make this new long range flame projection system. They responded that they could not, as even a 100 meter range necessitated a flame nozzle 22 millimeters wide and used 33 liters of fuel per second propelled by a 30 horsepower engine driving a pumping system. To project a flame even further would require a narrower nozzle, but to add an additional layer of complexity, the mouse was not to have one flame projector nozzle, but two, one on each side. Consideration had actually been made to mount these nozzles on the turret and at the front of the tank's hull, which would assist with the range although it would prevent the use of flame to help enemy troops on the sides of the tank. Mounting the system on the front would require additional armor protection to prevent damage to the nozzles and to the fuel system of the tank, but even at the back, they were still substantially armored under a 150mm thick cowling. Altogether, this system weighed an extra 4.9 tons and added significant complexity to the design of the tank, not least of which was directing the flame projectors. That was to be done by an indicator for the radio operator in the front of the hull to control the direction and use of the flame projectors, but this complexity and the added weight was simply an unnecessary complication for the tank. Despite an attempt to reduce the weight to just 2 tons by reducing the armor over the projectors from 150mm to just 30mm on the front, the problems of the system, the already tight space requirements, and the growing weight of the mouse made this device highly impractical.
In May 1943, the entire flame projector idea was rightly abandoned. It had caused one other key change to the design of the mouse, which was to make it a lot heavier. The torsion bar suspension of the original design needed an additional bogey to bear the weight, but with the lack of space for it, the torsion bars were replaced with the volute spring suspension instead. Redesigning the turret to maximize space created almost as many problems for the main armament as it solved. The main armament was decided for the mouse around a simple three-weapon standard. The main gun was a 12.8cm gun, which was to be interchangeable with a 15cm gun, a secondary 7.5cm gun, and a forward-facing machine gun. These gun choices had come about as a result of needing to perform particular roles and had been variously modified in order to avoid technical problems and to allow for the use of sabot ammunition. The ammunition was modified to support these changes through the adoption of a unitary ammunition. However, the 7.5cm gun used the same ammunition as an L24, which was predominantly hollow charge ammunition. The general high explosive 7.5cm shell was considered unsuitable and even the armor-piercing Panzergranat 39 shell was considered poor. More than 50 millimeters of penetration was required for the L36, and it was expected that using the Panzer Granat 39, this longer 7.5 centimeter gun would be able to achieve that. Shells which were of second quality could therefore be used for this gun. Whilst existing shells were available for the 7.5 centimeter gun, new shells were needed for the 12.8 centimeter gun, and by March 1943, development of shells for this gun included a full caliber armor piercing shell, APCHET. Sabot armor piercing shells, hollow charge high explosive, smoke, anti concrete shells, high explosive, Bren Granada, incendiary, and a Leitgeschoss. All of the rounds were to be fitted with a tracer able to provide tracing of the shell out to 3,000 meters. Another full caliber 12.8 centimeter anti armor shell, a ballistic capped armor piercing shell, would follow later on. An important note on the 12.8 centimeter gun is that right from the start of the development of a main gun for the project, preference had been given to the use of unitary ammunition, a case and shell combined into a single piece. Firing tests conducted on 29th April 1943 compared the rates of fire between unitary and two-piece ammunition for a 12.8 centimeter gun in a wooden model of the turret to evaluate the differences. The results of firing just 15 rounds of each confirmed that unitary rounds were preferable. On 29th June 1943, unitary ammunition was ordered for the 12.8 cm KWK L55, but only for 300 rounds, with 100 to be delivered by 15th July 1943. The reason for this low number of rounds was due to production problems associated with the cases for the shells, and plans were put into place for two-piece ammunition to be used after this date for the 12.8 cm KWK. This also meant that later vehicles would need modifications made to the ammunition stowage arrangements. By the end of 1943, with the serial production cancelled, the mouse became a low priority, and although the 12.8cm KWK-44 gun was fitted as planned, the unitary ammunition did not join it. Instead, the mouse was fitted with racks for two-piece shells, with the shells stowed separately from the propellant containing cartridges at the back of the turret. Shells for the 7.5cm gun were stowed in the front right of the turret, just to the right of the gun. Ammunition for the 15cm gun was not as complicated, with high explosive, hollow charge, armor piercing, semi armor piercing, and an anti concrete shell. The requirements for the anti concrete shell for the 12.8cm gun were that it should be able to breach a reinforced concrete wall up to 4 meters thick, a substantial demand, but one that would enable a mouse to attack even the heaviest infantry and gun positions and knock them out. This focus on anti-concrete performance and the ability to fire sabot shells shows that the purpose of the, primary ar of the primary armament was to take out bunkers and heavy enemy armor, whilst the 7.5cm secondary gun was for light targets only, reducing waste of the larger shells. Production of the 15cm KWK L38 for the mouse was slow, and on 8th June 1944 the contract for production was cancelled, with only two gun tubes completed. The primary armament, the massive 12.8cm KWK-44, was, in spite of its huge size, a good fit for the turret and able to elevate between plus 24 degrees and minus 7. Mounted to the left of the secondary armament was the mount for the MG-34, although Waffenprüfungsamt requested an MG-42 instead. Stowage for ammunition was a large task. 85 rounds of ammunition for the 7.5cm gun were carried as an additional stowage for 26 rounds was added between June and July 1944. 
Thank you very much for watching this second installment of the Mouse series on the Tank Encyclopedia's YouTube channel. Be sure to hit subscribe and the bell icon as well as liking the video if you did and leave a comment down below. Let me know how I did and let me know how the Tank Encyclopedia's article is. I hope to see you again in the next episode.